All right. There we go. So this time I'd like to welcome back uh, Brian Zond. It's a privilege every time to uh, get a chance to hear from you or to talk to you. So thank you so much. Thank you, John. It's good to be with you. <laughs> I uh, We had done um, a previous interview about your most recent book, but I have to be honest, you said something in that interview that has haunted me since. Kind of two comments, and uh, I would love to hear you riff on these things, to be honest. First was uh, <laughs> David Bentley Hart asking, when will Christianity come to America, which has been honestly uh, a content of my journal a lot since then. But then second was you made a comment about how it seems to be very difficult for America to produce saints. And if we could have a conversation about those two things, I think the world kind of needs it after the week we had last week. Hmm. Yeah, and these questions, you know, I'll be honest with you, John, I do a ton of these podcasts. I mean, that's just the truth. And they almost always go down the same path, which is fine. Uh, so I pretty much end up saying the same thing over and over. These two questions are not the same. So is that right? Um, there'll be no stock answers coming from me. I'll be <laughs> okay. These are things that I have thought about, but I haven't presented much on. So, mm -hmm. so your first question, you want, you want to start with the David Bentley Hart quip? Sure. Cause that's a good one. You that's know, a good quip. I, I don't know how many people know David Bentley Hart, American Orthodox theologian, essayist, philosopher, total uh, freaking genius, <laughs> a rascable, uh, black belt and snark. <laughs> That's very true. But uh, yeah. a, a friend of mine was doing a podcast with him, and he, he said something to the effect of, you know, Christianity in America, you know, as setting up a question. And uh, DBH, as we call him, jumped in and says, well, I would not presume that Christianity has ever arrived on the American shores. Wow. Wow. I have since seen that in some of his writing. And of course, it, it is provocative. It's snarky. Uh, but I think there's something there. Mm -hmm. um, there's something there. I mean, of course, there's Christians in, in America. And of course, there you know, are churches and people who believe. And But... I, I thought that was insightful enough that I've remembered it and I've quoted it myself, mm -hmm. you know, more in casual conversation than anywhere else. But I think there's something to it. Um, so where to start? Okay, look, I should I should disclose this. So everybody knows I am I am embarrassingly unaffiliated mm. as far as any kind of Christian denomination. I do not boast in this. It's just you know, life happens, right? Mm -hmm. And so I'm a product of the Jesus movement. And by the time I was 22, I was our, our coffee house ministry thing had turned into a church. Right. I'm still with that church 40 years later. And we were and still are non denominational. I, I don't, I don't, I'm not terribly apologetic about it, but I don't think it's the best. It's just what happened. So I'm not I'm not an advocate for that. It's just what happened. What I am though is deeply, intentionally, ecumenical. I love mm -hmm. the whole body of Christ, and I could I could see myself in about any of them. So I just want to, you know, preface what I say with that. What what is what is Protestantism? Protestantism is modern Christianity. Mm -hmm. For good and ill. Uh, Protestant, in the West, I mean, if you are, if you live in the West and you're any version of Protestant, what you are is a Reformed Catholic. Yes. And, but there's problems there. Uh, Martin Luther was attempting a Reformation. Something had to be done. Mm -hmm. uh, don't, don't misread me as saying that Reformation was either A, not necessary, or B, not ultimately good. I think the Reformation was probably better for the Catholic Church than it was for the Protestant Church. <laughs> There's my provocative <laughs> statement. Um, something had to be done, but it also is a very 
it, it is it is Christianity in a modern form that mm. when it then comes to America, without any of these long ancient roots, mm -hmm. uh, it really lends itself too much toward uh, accommodating the modern spirit mm -hmm. and just sort of making up Christianity to be anything you want. Now, if someone is one inclined to argue with me they might say bz you are a prime example of that and i i would just say i'm just having a conversation here <laughs> i'm just okay. thinking out loud i get that uh here's another way of thinking about it imagine that 500 years from now which is really hard for people to do especially americans but imagine 500 years from now high school students are, you know, they're, they're in their world history class and they come to the two pages that cover the rise and fall of the American empire. Uh -huh. And they don't know much about it, you know, but they, re I think the lasting legacy of America may very well be, that is if we don't, you know, lead the world into a nuclear war. <laughs> that would be yeah. different. Let's, let's leave that aside, though. Uh, that the United States of America pioneered the idea of secular governance. Hmm. You know, when people say to me, well, America yeah. was founded as a Christian nation. I said, no, that was England. <laughs> America was very deliberate about in going a different direction. We're not going to have a state church. We're not going to be right. a, quote, Christian nation. We're going to have secular government. Now, uh, with the French Revolution that, you know, happened, what, 20s later, uh, they took it further, faster, perhaps. Mm. But the idea was pioneered by, you know, Jefferson and Hamilton and Franklin et al., that we will have government disconnected entirely from religion. Now, we're sort of inclined, and I, I'm not even making a comment on necessarily whether that's good or bad, mm -hmm. but it is what it is. And America is far more secular than America imagines. Because, that's a and it's because, yeah. because our Christianity is all tangled up mm -hmm. in empire. And so it makes it look like we are more pious, religious, observant, church going. I mean, we may be church going, although that's in rapid decline. Yeah. But it's so tied up with empire that it really is at its core, it's secular. Mm -hmm. It's it, so people will tell me, they'll say, well, Europe, Western Europe, you know, Germany, France, Spain, Portugal, England, uh, they're very secular now. They're post, they're very secular. Mm -hmm. But America still has a strong presence of Christianity. And I just beg to differ with it. I actually touch on that in the very first pages of When Everything's on Fire. I don't see it that way. I mean, I've spent a lot of time in these countries. And what I sense is very deep, though often quite forgotten Christian roots. Right. I come to America and I see a thin veneer of Christianity over really what is just civil religion. Mm-hmm. So anyway, that's that's my opening salvo on that. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, well there there is certainly a, a certain approach to history. There's a narrative, obviously, and uh, you and I are both fans of Walter Brueggemann, who mm -hmm. I met him back in D.C. a couple years ago, and he's this sweet old man he, who's just oh the he's the sweetest. No, he uh, he's he has sat here in this home with me and just been uh, as affable and fun and delightful yeah. as you can imagine. I mean, you don't ask of, of these great, you know, scholarly heroes. I don't ask of them anything more than what they have given us in their theological work. But what a bonus when they turn out to be just lovely people. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, but in his book, The um, Prophetic Imagination talks about the importance mm -hmm. of narrative and how the way that you talk about the story of what we've all gone through or the history, whether it's the uh, royal narrative, which is the narrative of the government right. or the narrative of the prophets. It's just profound. But as I'm thinking about some of what you said, there's, there was something that happened to me when I went to seminary is that I heard all these mystics talked about, but we never studied them. Mm -hmm. 
And so in the 10 years after seminary, I kept reading these people and I started thinking, these guys are where the mojo's at. And then as I kind of ended up doing what you in some sense have done is become kind of omni-denominational. I started yeah. reading outside of the Lutheran box and then outside the Presbyterian box, outside the Catholic box. I'm like, it only helps. But when you have a very narrow understanding yeah. of what's approved to be learned, you miss on the wide scope of what Christianity actually is. And that's why Dave Bentley Hart has been so helpful for me to read more of an Eastern Orthodox, even with his most recent right. one, uh, You Are Gods. I finished that one in about a week. Yeah, that's a great book. I loved it. It's got some punch to it. <laughs> his books tend to have a punch to them. Sure. I mean, that's that's characteristic of him. But I, I especially like that. And then, you know, he, he released two almost simultaneously. Mm -hmm. Right before that, he released uh, Tradition and Apocalypse, mm -hmm. which I also read, which was very interesting in that that's the book that a Protestant might read and go, yeah, yeah, it's kind of what we've always believed. Uh, there he is talking about how, um, the, you know, the, 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 uh, Orthodox and Catholic church mm -hmm. appeal to tradition. And yet you can never, that, that that's really more or less a game that we are playing because you can never really arrive at, okay, here is the foundation of that tradition. It's actually just something that is developed over time. And mm -hmm. then it has to continue to develop forward or you just get stuck. Um, but here, let me try to tie this together for just a second. So I, I see, I see secularism really prevailing. Footnote, let's stop here and have a footnote. Mm -hmm. Ivan Illich, he said, oh, stop with this talk of a secular, we're not in a secular age. Uh, the whole thing that drives secular progressivism is simply Christianity, <laughs> but not admitted to be so. <laughs> and in some ways, the secular critique of Christianity is that it is not Christian enough. <laughs> gotcha. I mean, yeah. it, it, as, as, as a secular critic would attack the church, they will use values that they inherited from Christianity unwittingly. They don't really know that's what they're doing, but the idea that there should be justice for all and there should, and there, and, mm -hmm. and we should, we should take care of the poor and we should not abuse people or whatever. Where does that come from? That doesn't come from the pagan world. Mm -hmm. Th that is, that is simply the leftover capital of a certain value system that was oh. brought into the Western world through the church. Okay, so that's that's a pushback, but still there is something to, if you don't want to call it secular, just call there is a, a departing from any acknowledged mm. affiliation with Christian faith occurring in the Western world with great rapidity. And I think that once that tsunami com mm. completes its scouring of America, I would see America, let's say the United States, United States, Canada, having a more difficult time of recovering because mm -hmm. we don't have those roots. Mm -hmm. In Europe, there are the, there is, you know, you, you have to, to, for whatever they're worth, you still have some state churches and you have at least even just physically, you just see the great edifices of a, of a civilization that was, Christ informed. And anybody that knows me knows I'm no I'm no fanboy of Christendom. I mean, if anything, I've been a pretty strident critic of it. Mm -hmm. And I suppose I will continue to be. I will, but it, it's complex. And what I'm, I'm just to make it as simple as possible, America doesn't have the long Christian history and the deep Christian roots that Western mm -hmm. Europe has. Right. And so that's what we're getting at with maybe DVH is I'm not sure Christianity has ever really arrived. And, um, mm -hmm. and, and the, the dominant form of Christianity you do see in America, it, it is very American. <laughs> I mean, it, I mean, yes. yeah, I'm sure that's, that's true all over the world. I get that, that, you know, what is, what is the Roman Catholic church? Well, in some ways it's the state church of the Roman empire. Now the advantage they have is their empire is gone. 
once your empire's gone, you can you say, all right, let's just get about the business of being the church. And that's a little better. Wow. And it's, it's global. It's global. So they're not, they don't, they haven't pledged all their allegiance to one particular nation. Um, the American, you know, most vocal church, uh, yeah, they're, they're the state church, of, even, even though it's de facto unofficial. Right. Let's just say it. The American Evangelical Church is the de facto state church. Mm -hmm. At least of the Republican Party. <laughs> yeah, I can say it that way. Uh, in Orthodoxy, th they have not been able to quite have that break, and so th that's you know that's the disaster we're mm -hmm. seeing with uh, the uh, Patriarch of Moscow, Kirill, just mm -hmm. being. <laughs> As Pope Francis said, this is not my words. This is not DBH yeah. snark master. Uh -huh. This is Pope Francis calling him Putin's altar boy. Oh my Dang. gosh. Pope I don't Francis think I knew that one. Oh, no, no, he had, he, he, <laughs> yes, he did. Oh, and see, no. the context was they had a, they had a video conference when this war began. Mm -hmm. They're like you and me, you know, they're sitting in front of their cameras talking. And for the first 30 minutes, all Kirill does is read a prepared statement that is nothing but Putin's talking points. But we've got the, you know, denazification and all this nonsense. Finally, Pope Francis interrupts him and says, brother, you know, we're not to use the language of politics. We're to use the language of Jesus. Wow. And kind of reproves him. And then later on, while being interviewed uh, by reporters, he said that he says, "Yeah, yes, Patriot Krill must not be Putin's older boy." My gosh! Well, that's I. I so, agree. but that's that's yeah. is not a part of it though. Is um, I I sent you an email previously because I was interested by this word Eurodivier. The Russian word for saint is also the word for fool mm -hmm. or idiot. And yeah. as I've been kind of wrestling through things, even with the most recent school shootings and and so many things. Saints in America need to be odd, but I think we've kind uh, well, of fallen into yeah, saints being consistent with American that's, values. That's the whole point, is that, you know, there. what about fools for Christ? Yes. I mean, that's, you know, that's, Russia has a, the Russian Orthodox Church has this long history of holy fools, and it's kind of hard to explain. You just need to meet them in some novels or something. Mm -hmm. But they are people who are odd, out of step, that you could at first easily dismiss as just being some sort of weirdo. But then all of, every so often they'll say something that's like, whoa, wait, 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 where did that come from? Yeah. That, that is very, it's, it's a word, this is a phrase from Brueggemann, a word from elsewhere yes. that seems to have particular resonance and, you know, prophetic punch. Um, America... I mean, what saints have we produced? I, I don't mean I'm not asking. I'm not asking for you know technical. They made right. it into the Hall of Fame. I mean, you know that that people go, yes, that's a saint. That's a saint. You know, there's there's Thomas Merton, maybe. You know, Dorothy Day, saint, certainly a mystic. Yeah. Uh, you know, Thomas Merton, but he, but he, let's remember, Thomas Merton wasn't born and raised in America. He ended up here, but that's he wasn't right. born and raised in America. Right. Um. You know, then there's kind of like the Catholic justice saints, you know, Dorothy Day and some people like that. But there's just not many. You know, Wendell Berry, we might think of in some ways, or at least more of a kind of a mystical prophet bringing a word from elsewhere. But we just don't have, it just doesn't seem like this is fertile soil for mm -hmm. producing the kind of people whose voices can be well heard and generally well respected. Uh, oh. Because it's got, it's got to sell in America, right? It's got to sell. Because we're all America is more than any nation in the history of the earth, commerce driven. Everybody knows that. That's not news. I mean, yes, every nation has commerce motives, and but but America's you know we're we're we are the champions of that, right? And um, and and that's one of the critiques I would make of the American church. It's very commercial. Mm. And yeah, man, a, a commercial Christianity is not going to produce very many saints. It, it can produce a lot of adherence and, um, uh, and, and it can, it can spread its brand globally and that's happening, you know, but 
it, it doesn't produce the kind of people who right who are known for their mystical writings and their deep spiritual insight i mean we don't have we're not gonna i don't see america having a julian of norwich you know mm. that is known very soon which we just right. had her feast day about a week and a half ago yeah there was um i didn't know that it, uh, is that uh, well, there's, on, on whose there's calendar is that there's one yeah. on the eighth and there's another one on the 13th because the lutherans like her but then eastern orthodox and their others like it on the 13th um mm. which yeah grab a hazelnut if you can in celebration of her but as you i was know, my my, my yeah. calendar i mean i i'm not an anglican but that's what i pay the most attention to but i don't think she's on i mean how do the anglicans not have julian norwich like you know oh yeah that's a great question that, that should right? be like their biggest deal <laughs> I yeah mean, right? she's one of them <laughs> of course yeah as i was um making notes just for myself and my own well-being, I guess, I was making concentric circles. And it's kind of a Venn diagram. And I've been thinking about how what keeps the institution open is one circle. And then the other circle is what helps people to grow spiritually. Yeah. And those two things don't completely overlap. They do. But there's an element of we have to choose sometimes what is it that can help us to grow spiritually, oh, even if it maybe hurts the, the institution. It, it, that that sounds like you've been sitting in our leadership team meetings. We talk about that oh, yeah. all the time that, you know, I don't know if you're familiar with, uh, well, it's made popular by Richard Rohr, but I don't, it, I think it's, I don't think it's original with him might be, I don't know. I'm not sure where it came from. I, I do know, but I've forgotten. Uh, first half and second half of life. Oh, you Carl know, Jung. You're familiar with that? Well, yeah, well, yeah, with that concept, you know, uh -huh. the first half of life, you're you're building, uh, you're learning the rules, you're learning to form an identity, you're learning how to achieve, uh, and just how to be successful. Those things matter. Then, hopefully, you begin to migrate into the second half of life, and you begin to hold those things more loosely, and you begin to pursue wisdom, more compassion, more depth of mystery. And so we have this conversation, can, is there such a thing as a, see, it seems like every church in America is a first half of life church. Well, but then, but then That's you try to be a phrase. second. Okay. Yeah. Then you try to be a second, but you, you want to be a second half of life church. I mean, you want it led by true elders, right? You know what I mean by that? Yeah, sure. Uh -huh. Men and women who, who have become contemplative. But that's not terribly attractive, and I mean attractive in the most literal mm -hmm. sense of the world. It's it's word. It's hard to attract people. So so we're always having to your Venn diagram. Mm -hmm. There, you know, we do have to. I mean, we can we can sit around and talk about how pious we are. We are seven people, mm -hmm. <laughs> or we can say, okay, we 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 need to be engaging enough reflecting enough of the culture to attract people, but then try to move them into mm -hmm. kingdom. It's, it's endlessly challenging, but I, but I don't want to sit here and moan. And I mean, I suppose that's always been a challenge for the church, right? I suppose. Right, true. Let you as a suppose. Here. But it just, it seems, it's, it seems to me, I mean, maybe I'm just, since this is the only life that I've lived as far as I know, <laughs> uh, it, it does seem that being a pastor, in America, in the early 21st century, right. is not an easy gig. Again, no. I know people are going to be, I mean, people are not prone to give sympathy to pastors, and I'm not looking for it. But I'm just saying, it's not an easy task. Mm -hmm. I'm not talking about the hours or, or the pay or, or whether or not you're appreciated. I'm just saying just the task. Make disciples out of contemporary Americans. It's a hard oh job. My gosh. Yeah. Because because they're already they're already thoroughly discipled. All of us, I mean I'll include myself too. We're already thoroughly discipled into a rival religion called America wow. that we don't even recognize most of the time as a religion. Mm -hmm. And that's so right. that's one of our real challenges. And I mean that goes back to the original meaning of the word religion if it actually does come from religio or religere meaning to rebind right. what holds you together america definitely has a philosophy that says this will hold your life together and it's not really orthodox christianity that's being taught commonplace i guess is the thing that holds people together i'm, I'm fascinated with though with 
Jesus, he doesn't ever seem to force people to grow, but he always invites them to do so. Yeah. Because there's something about the forcibleness. Now, that was actually one of my difficulties in my previous life doing youth ministry is like, I can only invite the kids to grow in their own right. faith. I can only invite that. It's very difficult to make anyone become a, a believer before they're 18 and graduate to college. But I feel like Jesus set that model of just constantly throwing out the fishing nets, just constantly inviting. Yeah, I, I have a I have a story about that. You know, I've been the pastor of one church for 40 years, one congregation. And I remember pretty early on, you know, this is probably within the first 10 years. I remember being frustrated because the church was small enough. I pretty much knew everybody mm -hmm. and I could have a lot of, you know, I could just work with everybody sort of like. And I, I would, in some people, you know, I, some people would seem like they were enthusiastic about Jesus and they're beginning to grow. And I would kind of just leave them alone and say, okay, they're, they're doing good. They're okay. And I was putting my effort into the people that, that seemed bored, mostly uninterested. They're okay. just kind of on the periphery. And I was praying about it one day. And, and I, I remember that, that passage of Scripture where Jesus says, I only do what I see the Father doing. And I felt like Jesus spoke to huh. me and said, and said, you know, thus and so, these people are, do you see me doing much in their life? And I say, uh, honestly, no. <laughs> he said, well, then don't, don't spend your time there. Wow. Where you see that I'm actually doing something in someone's life, go there. And so, I mean, of course, that you could pit that against, you know, they, we leave the 99 to go find the one. I get that. Right. Uh, but I'm just trying to affirm your point mm. that we, we lead by inspiration almost, I mean, entirely. I mean, we, we don't have, I mean, whether it's good or bad, I don't know. I mean, I could argue both sides. A, a, a church structure where, you know, some of the leadership actually has, in some ways, some authority, right? Mm. I mean, uh we don't. <laughs> I mean, I can't make anybody that's do right. anything. I don't. I don't have any coercive means. And all in all, I think that's really good. Uh, yeah. So I can. I can only lead by inspiration. That is, they they mm. want to. They're attracted to what of Christ they see in my life and want to be around that and want to emulate some of that that's the only way we can lead it's we we have no mm -hmm. coercive methods at all when that, that's good right because as soon as that does happen it makes for a very unhealthy toxic environment and of course people use the word toxic and then you got to have a reformation yeah then you got to have a reformation <laughs> right <laughs> yeah i um i was fascinated as oh my god I, everything that happened last week with the school yeah. shooting, but then also SBC and how it reported on a lot of abuse. And my mind actually went to Dorothy Day, who talked about how our problems stem from our acceptance of this filthy, rotten system. Hmm. And Dorothy Day, she she had a punchiness to her as well. Oh, yeah. But yeah. Man, she was a prophet. She was a prophet. Well, look. You know, I've really traveled the world. I've been all over. And not so much in the last couple of years, but even even the last couple of years, I've been overseas a couple of times. But um, that's the question that that people outside of America sincerely have and sincerely don't understand. There's, you know, America. First of all, people outside of America know America. I mean, mm -hmm. we're we're famous. That's right. Mm -hmm. And because our because of, because our culture is everywhere. And there's two things they don't understand about America. They don't understand our healthcare system mm -hmm. and they don't understand our guns. And I can kind of, I don't agree with it, but I can, I can kind of explain to them what's happened with our healthcare system. I, the gun thing is something I've thought about mm. for decades. It's not a new topic for me. And I still find it very mysterious. I mean, mm. the, the fetish, the religious devotion that a certain s large segment of America has toward guns is cultish. I, I want to use strong language. It's demonic. 
mm-hmm. and it's it's almost unbreakable. Um, America is an idolatrous nation. We know that. I mean, you, I suppose you can say that about every nation. I'm sure that's true. But uh-huh. but you know, when you become an empire, it's different. When you're a superpower, it's different. When you're global, it's different. America is an idolatrous nation. We have many gods, but the cult of the gun is the most fanatical, most devoted cult we have in right. America. And I can't fully explain it. I mean, it would take, I don't know who it would take. It would take, uh, I don't know, it, does it take a sociologist, a psychologist, a theologian, a historian? Um, probably takes all of that. All of that. To explain how we've arrived at this point where, well, I don't know what the percentage is, but a certain percentage of people in America actually belong to a cult that worships the ideal, the myth mm. of redemptive violence through guns. And it, it's, on the other hand, I, I said that, on the other hand, you just, some of it's just plain politics with the NRA, which is not what it, you know, the, it, it's not an advocacy group. It's a gun lobby. Mm-hmm. And, you know, if, if I think, you know, this, I don't have the statistics in front of me. It doesn't matter. Uh, you know, this, people tell me that something like 90% of Americans think, you know, yeah, you probably should have a background check before you can Absolutely. go buy these things. I mean, there, there, there's all kinds of things that could be done, but one party's completely completely controlled by a gun lobby Mm. and it's it would be it's you know i i talk about it on social media i you know people know what i believe about it and it's and by the way my opinion on guns hasn't changed in how old am i it hasn't changed in 50 years (laughs) i've never been on board with that i mean i spent a good long while in the in the stream of you know the religious right and all that sort of stuff but i was never on board with the nutty gun and and that's gotten worse too i mean there wasn't a ba- there was a ban on assault rifles that's right after and then after reagan was shot in happenings after it was expired that law it, it had a 10 year it had an expiration date it was the brady bill is that thing mm-hmm. and and uh president bush the second one i think I don't know if it was the first or second one, didn't renew it and whatever. I don't want to talk politics, but, um, <laughs> okay. yeah, I, but yeah, it's, uh, I, I, I don't know what words to you. I mean, I, when, when I, I heard it was, it was a week ago today, you know, we're, we're, it was a yeah. week ago uh-huh. today uh-huh. and, and I had been for a walk and I was listening to the brothers Karamanzov because, you know, oh, yeah. I'm a mm-hmm. fanatic. And uh, then I, I got back. I had a lovely walk, and I, I find out. Uh, the first thing I heard was 14. It turned out to be 19, but the first thing I heard was 14 children shot and killed. With it. You didn't need to know. You already knew it was an AR-15. Of course it was in a school in Texas. And I, I, do, I really, honestly, I don't use profane language. I never use profanity in the pulpit. I never have. I just... I mean, uh, whatever. Mm-hmm. I just not my style. I don't like that. But I immediately just tweeted, "God damn it!" Yeah. When are we going to get these goddamn guns out of the hands of these people? God damn it! And there, there were some people, you know, that were shocked or disappointed in me or pastor. You can't talk like that. I said, I don't know. Well, then what am what am I supposed to say? Right. Um. You know, the the violation of the third commandment is not that it's attaching the name of God to something God. You know, you see these campaign slogans, Jesus, guns, babies. That's right, yeah. That's taking the name of the Lord in vain, Uh uh, connecting Jesus with guns. Right. So, uh, again, and I'm not even saying, I'm not going to defend my use of that kind of language on a public, you know, platform. Other than what am I going to say? I just... It doesn't (sighs) sound that far off to me from um, Isaiah. When he goes around and says, what was you, what was you, what was you, what was me? Yeah. And maybe it's a slightly different phrasing, but the the intensity of the emotion. And I, we're, right. we're both fans, I think, of Heschel. He would talk about the yeah. prophets are the ones that actually feel when everybody else feel, seems numb. They're the ones right. that almost take the whisper of the pain and put it through a megaphone so everyone could hear what they've narcotized themselves from being able to hear. But... Can I share with you a quote that made me think of you? 
sure. in a good way <laughs> okay. is that uh, Martin Luther, he talks about how if you ever preach without preaching to the issues of the day, then you're not preaching the gospel at all. Mm. And if mm. I can say anything, you've been a really good example of someone that doesn't seem afraid to talk about whatever's happening that current week or whatever's happening in that season of life. And uh, I just really think that's commendable. That's all. I want to say thank I you, John. You've that's, been a that's, job. that's very kind of you. Thank you. And uh, I mean, obviously, I follow you online, but I think the world needs more people that um, not necessarily that have to always speak the truth, but at least can feel in front of people publicly what maybe is actually the heart of God in that situation. That's just remarkable. Um, thank you. Let me. Um, let me wrap this up. I just want to say thank you for your time. It's always a privilege to to talk to you, but I watch your services every Sunday. I've read five of your books, but not all of them. I'll, I'll admit that. But um, yeah, you're a wonderful guy. Thank you. Thank you, John.